So when you're designing a circuit board, there's a whole bunch of technology, some of which is relevant to the boards being designed at the home, hobby, or educational level, and some of which is maybe more relevant to professionally designed boards. Most of the software that we use is going to have uh, all of the terms that professional board designers would use. And uh, sometimes if you know what those terms are, you can filter out the ones that uh, we use and what we're going to need to add to our boards and uh, ignore some of the ones that are needed for higher level work. So this is an example of a typical DIY board. It's on a little uh, homemade robot, shop made robot, I should say, uh, called the Boombot. And uh, this type of board is ideal for home hobby and educational designers because it's fairly easy to make with some fairly simple supplies. And this is what we refer to as a single layer board because it's only got one layer of copper on it. Although this board right over here uses jumpers in this section right here to simulate having a top copper layer because that allows signals to come from right here and jump over top of all of the copper passing underneath there. It's mostly what we call through hole components. And you can see your through hole components uh, are called that because they have leads that go through a hole and solder on the back side of the board. That's in comparison to a surface mount component, such as you can see up here on the ultrasonic rangefinder, where the components mount directly onto the surface. Uh, this board actually has a surface mount chip uh, called an L293D that is uh, hidden on the back side of the board, kind of right underneath here. Uh, so you can do surface mount devices using uh, home and hobby equipment, but when you do an industrial process, you'll find that they're much more common. They allow you a lot finer pitch. You can see each of the little, uh, uh, each of the little leads coming down here are a heck of a lot finer than the individual leads coming off of our diode right here or other surface mount components. We also have headers on the board, and the headers allow for the use of removable components. So in this case, this set of headers right here is designed to match the uh, pins from an Arduino. So you can flip an Arduino upside down, slap it onto the board right here, and the Arduino will form the brains of your board. Uh, we've, these are just standard headers, but right in here you can see we've got some locking headers, and the locking headers are uh, really great. They work with these uh, MTA100 connections connectors and you can do a crimp connection of your wire right into here and then we can connect another board down here to this board right up here. Uh, then of course we've got important things like the mounting holes uh, to allow connection to the case. A standard mistake for uh, beginning designers is to just screw their circuit board straight down onto a case. You'll notice that there's a thin air gap between the board right here. Uh, between the board and the case, um, right underneath the screw there, we have spacers uh, that are used, uh, or standoffs as they're also known, to separate the uh, uh, two parts. So on this board, uh, we've got jumpers, we've got headers, we've got the mounting holes, we've got a whole range of components. I've only highlighted a couple of them there. We've got our top documentation layer. So this is also a toner transfer layer that we put on after we've finished etching the board, and it contains any information that's going to be useful for somebody who comes along to use the board later on. And in this particular setup, because we've got an upside down board right in here, you can also see the bottom copper layer where our tracks and solder joints are exposed. Again, you don't see the standoffs, the spacers separating this board from the metal components right there. Very important that any time you mount a board that you have it properly supported. So let's take a look at a single-sided board in more detail because this is the most common do-it-yourself board. And these are fairly easy to manufacture with toner transfer and etchant. Uh, you can actually make these at home if you really want to. Uh, it's great for one-off boards and uh, it's really suitable for learning and prototyping because you can make a lot of mistakes fairly inexpensively. Um, that's probably making mistakes is maybe not what we should recommend as the number one uh, goal in uh, doing this, but certainly making mistakes allows for learning. The downside, uh, if you are planning to mass produce boards, is it tends to be a little bit labor intensity, uh, intensive. You've got a low component density. It's harder to pack things on there really tight. 
and uh, unless you uh, decide to put a documentation layer on the top, you have no documentation layers. You'll also notice that these uh, copper uh, traces right here are uh, are starting to corrode just a little bit or tarnish a little bit. They're not nice and shiny like they were when I made this board. This board has been sitting around in my uh, back of my shop for a year or two waiting to be finished. And uh, so if I was going to work on this again, I'd want to come along and polish up all those layers to let the solder um, join to it more nicely. But uh, in a commercially manufactured board, you'd get uh, a solution and you'd have these uh, plated, usually with a tin type of coating. You can get a plating solution that you can dip your homemade boards in and they will uh, automatically plate themselves. It tends to be a little bit stinky, a little bit expensive, and probably not necessary uh, unless you're really going for some high quality finish on there. The board material itself, uh, the, the kind of green material that the copper is attached to, is referred to as FR4. Now there are other grades, there's FR2s and there's all sorts of different materials that you can get for your board, but if you're doing this on a home or hobby basis, you're using FR4 material almost exclusively. It's a glass reinforced epoxy material, so basically fiberglass and uh, on top of it it's got a thin layer of copper pressed onto it. That layer of copper is about the thickness of one sheet of paper and uh, we refer to that as one ounce copper because uh, it uh, weighs one ounce per square foot of the board surface area. There are lighter weight boards that uh, you would use if you had something that you wanted to etch faster. So you can get half ounce boards where the copper layer is half as thick, or you can get two and four ounce boards, which will take longer to etch, but will have a much thicker copper layer that's suitable for moving uh, heavier currents around on your board. So if you're creating a speed controller or a power supply, you probably need to move up to a, a heavier uh, copper plating on your board. You can also do a few tricks. So for instance, if you just needed a heavier uh, current to flow through one part of the board, you can make your trace a little bit wider and then you can actually lay some solder over top of it and that will help improve uh, the conductivity of that trace just a little bit. So some of the terms that we see on here, we have a dip socket. DIP is short for dual inline package, and that is a standard integrated circuit uh, that, uh, that you'd see for a lot of projects that we work with. And uh, the DIP packages uh, are usually defined by the number of pins that they have. So you can do a quick pin count and they usually start with an eight pin DIP package. The single inline package, uh, SIP is uh, not as common a terminology, but you will see it pop up from time to time. And basically all it means is a bunch of holes in a row. Both the SIP and DIP standard packages have the uh, pitch or the spacing between the hole diameters between the pads. The spacing between the pads is the pitch. And that is uh, typically at 0.1 of an inch or 2.54 millimeters. The annular ring refers to the amount of copper that is left behind after you uh, plate your uh, create your trace and then drill out your hole. So we're looking at the little area between those two yellow circles right there. And if you're teaching people to solder and you're making boards for the first time, having a larger annular ring is better than having a smaller annular ring. Uh, we uh, have a couple different names for our tracks. We can call them a track, we can call them a trace, and uh, of course the track width or trace width uh, is quite important. When you're etching at home, you can probably start with about a 15 thou uh, track width, but really if you're working with uh, students and you want to increase your reliability, go to a slightly wider track width, maybe 20 to 25 thou, and uh, you'll probably be happier. And if you're moving a lot of current, go up to a wider track width still. Uh, the tracks connect pads to form nets. So uh, any one of these tracks that comes along right here, you can see that it connects this pad, this pad, and this pad. Well, those show up as nets. And when you're routing your board in your software, uh, those will show up as an air wire because in your schematic, you said that this pin needs to connect to this pin and needs to connect to this pin. So uh, the net is the logical equivalent 
whereas the track or the trace is the physical equivalent. Our pads can have a number of different shapes. You'll notice we have a lot of round pads. These ones are slightly oval shaped or actually more rectangle with rounded corners. And uh, again, the spacing between them is called the pitch and the drill hole diameter uh, matters. To increase your annular ring, you probably also want to increase the pad diameter if you're working with people who are new to soldering. Now, a double-sided board uh, adds a few more options. Technically, you can make a double-sided board at home using techniques similar to the single-sided board, but you have to be very careful about um, aligning the top layer and the bottom layer. Uh, that's because the top layer and the bottom layer have to match up where the hole goes through. Now, the downside of uh, doing this on a uh, home, homemade board is that you can't plate your through holes as easily. So when they manufacture a printed circuit board at the uh, factory or at a fab shop, they use a slightly different um, manufacturing process. They start with the uh, board just being blank, and then they drill the holes in it. So you have a blank board with all the holes uh, in it, and then they plate it and cover it all with copper. And so uh, that means that because the holes are drilled before the plating happens, the copper goes all the way through the hole and you get uh, this through plated hole. And then they'll plate it with tin and the tin will serve as the protectant and then they'll etch everything else off. So you end up with these nice through plated holes. Now the, uh, uh, Sometimes you'll also see these little holes right here called vias. These holes right here are designed for our leads to go through for our through hole components. So our resistor would come through here and the lead would go through right here. And when you solder on either side of a through hole, uh, through plated hole, you solder both sides of that because of course it's connected top and bottom. Your solder goes in and fills in there. You actually get really, really nice solder joints that are uh, more difficult to undo if you make a mistake than just a standard single sided board. But right in here, we have a via, and you can see that's really too small for any leads to fit down in there. And all that's doing is that's taking the electricity from this pin and dropping it through the board right there and using that through hole plating to get that signal down in here so that these two lines uh, touch onto each other. So uh, as you can see, this is a fairly simple, fairly uh, inexpensive uh, board. It was actually just manufactured as a test to see what sort of quality this particular manufacturer would uh, hand back, and we were relatively pleased. Some things down here that if I was uh, going to do this board myself, I probably would have looked at how I could space some of this apart uh, a little bit more in there. I don't quite like how that all comes close together. But on the other hand, if you're teaching someone to solder and you want to uh, encourage a bit of precision, it's always good to give them uh, one or two uh, tough ones to solder up to. So this is a slightly more sophisticated two layer commercially produced board. And this one has a layer that we call the uh, solder mask. And that's the green that you see on here. If we remove that green layer, the board would look just like all the other boards. And what the solder mask is, it's a polymer coating that uh, protects the traces from shorting out. So if you rest the board on something, uh, you know, this big section right in here, is not going to connect to anything because it's got a little layer of insulating plastic over top of it. Uh, the other thing that the solder mask does is it resists solder, hence the, we, why we call it the solder mask. And so if you're soldering right here, sometimes you'll know if you put too much solder onto a hole, the solder will start to spill over and jump to the next hole. But this is kind of like a, I won't say hydrophobic coating, it's more of a solder phobic coating. So the solder really doesn't want to spread away from that pad. It just wants to stay right in there on that pad. Something to note about uh, this board is that, uh, for instance, on our DIP package right here, on the DIP package for our motor driver chip, Pin one is identified by having a different pad shape than all the rest of the pads in that dip chip. And uh, here we can see for uh, chip number two, it's also missing. Uh, it's also got a different uh, pad shape on number one. And of course, the numbering and the DIP chips starts with pad one 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So an 18 pin DIP uh, socket would go right in there. And again, typically you machine a socket in there so that you can then uh, press and remove your uh, rather more expensive and more delicate chip from there. So uh, just uh, a couple of notes on here. Some other things that you see on here, you'll see reference to a copper pour. And here is just a bunch of excess copper material. And when you see it in the backlight shape, you can see that it really uh, blocks off the light right there. This is where a motor driver chip goes in. And motor driver chips tend to generate a lot of heat because they tend to carry a lot of current. So by doing this, all of the ground pins, these four ground pins of the L293D right in the middle, uh, those four ground pins can take heat out of the chip, transfer it into the board, and spread that uh, heat out over a larger area, helping with uh, that heat uh, being able to make it into the atmosphere and stop from frying your uh, chip. There's a whole bunch of other uses for copper pours, but uh, again, if you're doing it at the home hobbyist level, level, often you don't need to worry about them that much. Now this is a Raspberry Pi Zero, and uh, this is a much higher complexity uh, board. You're not making one of these at home. Uh, although the board is the same thickness as the boards that we've already been looking at it, crammed into there, they've got six layers of copper. So they'll basically make this as a number of uh, different printed circuit boards and then squash them all together into uh, one, uh, one, one board. It's an amazing uh, design process and an amazing manufacturing process, and it allows for an incredible level of complexity. If you look at all of the vias taking place right here and how they manage to transfer that, uh, that's those signals back and forth, some will be transferring the signal to the second layer, some to the third, some to the fourth, some will go all the way through to the bottom and transfer it down to the sixth layer right here. And here you'll see a lot more use of copper pores. Uh, copper pores in our previous uh, drawing were, or, or previous image, were primarily being used for heat dissipation, but I suspect in here they're being used to suppress electrical noise because we've got some very high frequency signals coming through here. Some uh, Something else to look at when you're looking down here is there's these really cool wire routings right here, and you'll see these two wires come all the way along right next to each other all the way here and then just before they connect this one goes off and does a little bit of a dog leg for no apparent reason well if you look at how they're traced they come around this corner the inside uh, line is slightly shorter because when it goes around a corner it's always got the slightly shorter side when it comes out here this goes out here and then comes back in so that these two lines from pad to pad are the exact same length. And that matters because the signal data is moving so fast on some of these lines that the time that the signal arrives at this point right here, one would actually receive the signal noticeably faster than the other one if the lines were not the exact same length. So if uh, if you think you're starting to rock it pretty good making your uh, uh, own boards for home use, uh, there's a whole nother layer of things that come into play when you take it up to being a professional. You can see that this board also has a uh, solder resist on it, which is designed to uh, help protect the circuits and to make it easier to solder your header into these uh, um, holes right here but they've removed uh, or left off the solder mask in a number of places so that they have test points so you can get in and you can test various things on the board more commonly that's something that they would do at the factory to make sure that the uh, board was uh, all put together properly uh, the raspberry pi of course a fabulous story of uh, people just saying hey maybe we could make 10,000 of these and watching it go completely, completely crazy and out of control. All right, um, so there's uh, one schematic uh, 
and uh, many uh, different solutions for uh, for your board. So an Arduino is a pretty standard device, but uh, if you've purchased Arduinos uh, either from your local electronic shop where you probably got an original made in Italy Arduino or from online where you probably got a uh, less expensive made in China Arduino, you'll see that uh, although they, they, they do the same thing, they look quite different. Just realize down here that this header is missing a it's plastic socket. That's not an intentional thing. I sh should have used one in a little bit better shape. However, I will notice that the slightly more expensive uh, brand name Arduino has not lost its header right in here. So uh, some of the things to take a look at between the two boards. Here we have a dip chip for our Atmega 328. And here we have a surface mount chip. And this is called a QFP package or quad flat package. Whereas here we've got a different format of surface mount called the SOIC, or Small Outline Integrated Circuit. Now, although this is a QFP over here, this is also a QFP right here, but with a different pitch on the pins. So this one right here, if you were doing uh, hand solder work, this is probably still within the realm of what you could hand solder. And this is probably within the realm of what you could solder when you were like 21, if you were really, really calm. Maybe target shooters can do that. Anyways, it's a little more challenging to solder by hand. Most of these boards will be assembled by a robot and a, they'll uh, go down an assembly line and a pick and place robot will pick the parts, the capacitors, the resistors, the chips off of, uh, off of uh, rolls and rolls and rolls of uh, this material, place them onto uh, the board. There'll be a little bit of uh, solder on the board. It'll have been applied uh, with a solder mask. It'll have been wiped across the board. And uh, then they'll uh, uh, just keep flowing down the assembly line through an oven where the solder will all be melted. They'll come out the other side and they'll be tested. Uh, other things to look at on the board is uh, an SOT uh, package for the voltage regulators and the naming for some of the uh, chips, uh, or, sorry, for some of the components here, the capacitors and the LEDs, the resistors, is usually based on their size. And of course, there's a little bit of uh, imperial and metric wrangling going on. So we might call them an 0805 if they're eight thousands, or sorry, 80 thou by 50 thou, or the same thing in metric might be called a 2012, two millimeters by 1.2 millimeters. In either case, they make a grain of rice look large. There's a lot to be learned from looking at circuit boards and a lot that you can apply to the boards that you make. But by and large, it's reasonably easy to make a single-sided uh, board uh, in the DIY shop and you can do amazing things with a single-sided board, particularly if you add a few jumpers to them.